Shalom from Jerusalem. This is TV7's Israel at War update. And as we return, at least with me here at the seat, after Amir Oren faithfully took care of uh, business during my absence, it's always important to return to the root cause of the latest hostilities, and that is 189 days ago, when the Islamist terror groups from the Hamas blade Gaza Strip launched an onslaught on southern Israel, declaring war by perpetrating a massacre murdering some 1,200 mostly civilians, wounding over 4,800 others, and kidnapping 246 people, including elderly men, women, children, and infants. 133 of them remain in Hamas captivity to date. Let's now turn to TV7's editor-at-large, namely Mr. Amir Oren. Amir, what can you tell us about the latest with key focus on the threats emanating from the East? So, uh, welcome back, Jonathan. And uh, there's action on all of Israel's fronts. Uh, you hear of uh, successful operations, uh, both in uh, the central part uh, of Gaza, in uh, the uh, West Bank, and uh, separately uh, from that, the uh, naval uh, forces of CENTCOM, the uh, US Central Command, uh, have successfully intercepted more uh, drones or uh, missiles launched uh, by the um, Houthis. There's also action uh, on the Lebanese front, although um, on a lower uh, scale. Now, in Gaza, uh, because of um, American uh, pressure, one may turn the current phase aid and trade. More and more humanitarian aid trucks are coming in, including uh, into the northern sector and israel has changed uh, its deployment and tactics from uh, keeping brigades and even divisions inside the street to uh, going out and coming back in as needed per intelligence very focused intelligence leading to raids and uh, either killing or capturing uh, terrorists but as you said, the main focus uh, today and uh, probably throughout uh, this coming weekend is going uh, to be the expectation for Iran to make good, or in this case, make bad on its uh, threats to um, attack Israel in retaliation for the <laughs> loss of several of its own senior uh, IRGC officers who were killed in Damascus in an attack on uh, one of their headquarters, uh, which uh, was uh, masquerading under diplomatic or consular cover. And uh, apparently these, uh, the preparations for carrying out uh, these attacks uh, were visible to Western intelligence. The uh, preparations are real, but the final order may not have been given yet. Uh, it is uh, waiting for the Supreme Leader Khamenei. And by the way, if uh, this order is given and intercepted by um, Western ears and eyes, it may tell us a lot about um, outsiders' ability to find out um, what the Iranian intentions and actions are regarding their nuclear project too. Indeed. Well, uh, General uh, Gavish, it's good to see you, uh, namely Brigadier General in Reserve, Commander of the Israeli Air Force Task Force for Air and Missile Defense. Uh, I'd like to immediately dive into uh, the eastern threat emanating out of the Islamic Republic of Iran. IDF Chief of General Staff Lieutenant General Helzi Alevi highlighted the IDF's preparedness, not only in defense, but also on the offensive front. What can you tell us about that, and to what degree is there uh, concrete evidence of Iranian efforts to scramble around, uh, including via its proxies, but also Iran proper, uh, to target Israel? Well, first, uh, Jonathan, is, it is great uh, to have you back. Uh, you know, with regard to Iran, uh, for those that are following us uh, for the last uh, few months, we they know that we talked about it uh, more than once. And, uh, you know, it is quite uh, 
I would say uh, it's not it's not surprising uh, at all from from our point of view, but there are those that are kind of asking themselves how Iran became a part of this war. And from from our point of view, Iran was part of this war from the first days, uh, because the ones that were shooting uh, missiles toward Israel uh, from Lebanon, which is Hezbollah, uh, from uh, Syria, from uh, UAVs coming from Iraq. And of course, missiles coming uh, from Yemen, the Houthis, all those are Iranians' uh, proxies. All those are being, uh, all their ammunition is being uh, produced by Iran. Uh, the money is um, Iranian uh, money. So uh, we shouldn't be surprised that uh, Iran is part of this war. The only change uh, or the only difference is that now the Iranian, uh, after uh, um, the, the one of a few of the uh, commanders, uh, uh, leaders uh, that were uh, in charge of, uh, um, you know, on the on the Syrian, uh, let's call it pace, uh, uh, the Syrian effort, those uh, are now uh, looking at us from the sky. So now uh, the, there is this uh, um, statement made by the Iranians that they are going to, uh, um, uh, from their point of view, to retaliate and. Uh, and uh, we understand that some of them are saying that they would do it from their own uh, homeland and so on. But again, we shouldn't be surprised. We saw the Iranian uh, uh, shooting toward uh, Pakistan. Uh, we saw them uh, shooting uh, toward the uh, other areas. And as I said all this time, they were shooting toward Israel by just by doing it by the process. From the Israeli point of view, we have to remember that, uh, of course, we take very seriously the Iranian uh, threat. Uh, and uh, you just mentioned what, again, we talk more than one, once. It's about the Israeli strategy when it comes to uh, rockets and missiles. Uh, the, the strategy talks about uh, defense efforts, uh, passive and active, uh, alerts uh, efforts, and uh, attack. This is all part of the doctrine, and uh, this is why uh, General Herzl Levy uh, was uh, saying that if Israel would be attacked, uh, of course, Israel is going to uh, retaliate as part of uh, our strategy when it come, uh, comes to this. Of course, when uh, we're talking about uh, Iran, uh, this is a challenging uh, threat. Uh, but here again, uh, we saw the Israeli defense uh, systems. Uh, more than once, we have to remember that uh, the multi-tier defense of Israel was designed exactly for this. We mainly saw the Iron Dome and the and of course, the David Sling, but now uh, the, the, the systems which are relevant are the Aero 2 and the Aero 3. And also, we have to remember also on this that the other international efforts, mainly by uh, CENTCOM, we just heard about a uh, missile that was uh, by you. Uh, you just mentioned uh, a missile, uh, or Amir, I think, a missile that were intercepted by the by CENTCOM, a missile uh, that was uh, launched by the Houthis. Uh, so we have to remember that there are some uh, U.S. assets which are also here in this, uh, in our area. The collaboration between us and the United States is uh, is very, very strong, even more uh, in the last uh, few days. Uh, so, you know, we are uh, in the defense. Uh, all the systems are uh, alerted. And uh, if it, uh, we take... Uh, if this is what it takes, uh, Israel would do what it needs uh, also, also in the offensive side. Indeed. Of course, uh, the IDF general staff has already prepared its uh, uh, various plans for a counteroffensive uh, presented to the war cabinet and the cabinet uh, uh, evidently approved these uh, plans. Uh, but let's now turn to Madrid, Spain, where we're joined by Dr. Rafael Bardají, uh, formerly a Spanish national security advisor and currently the CEO of Worldwide Strategy. It's good to see you, sir. Uh, I'd like to ask you, as you just uh, recently returned from Israel and uh, roamed the halls of, uh, of course, uh, power here in Jerusalem and elsewhere uh, with keen insight on uh, pretty much everything that is taking place at this point in time. And uh, when we look at the current climate of war, we see that uh, uh, the Ayatollah regime is, uh, of course, poised on potentially additional adventurism. Uh, we saw Ayatollah Ali Khamenei uh, deliver his uh, 
uh, Eid address with uh, his Dragunov uh, sniper rifle in hand and making so uh, all kind of promises that he usually fails to uh, fulfill. But nonetheless, uh, they seem to be very determined uh, at this point uh, in time. And we're hearing more and more the international community, at least uh, the more rational side of the international community on the Western hemisphere, uh, seeking to stand by Israel and emphasizing that uh, whatever Israel needs to do in the face of Iranian aggression is legitimate. Yes, but let me let me say something more basic, uh, Jonathan, if I may allow to, to do that. Uh, the last uh, Israeli ambassador to Iran before the collapse of the Shah regime told me once that an Iranian is somebody that never say what he thinks and never do what they what they say. So mm -hmm. I I am conf I mean I'm sure that they will be planning a direct hit in Israel soil as a retaliation. But I wouldn't be surprised if they don't do anything now. I think there are other options, and I think we should prepare for everything, but we should avoid the temptation to project our logic into the Iranian minds. They are clever, they are sophisticated, and they may be thinking totally different from us. No? And what I saw in Israel in the last days, uh, yes, is uh, the conviction that Iran is going to hit and they're going to send a mixture of, uh, or a mix, a cocktail of uh, drones, uh, cruise missiles, ballistic missiles, because that's what they did against uh, Saudi Arabia, that's what they did against Pakistan, as I've been mentioning here. But they may be thinking something totally different. They may be wait, they may be try to accelerate the nuclear program, and when they are able to do a test, they may retaliate then. So what I'm trying to say and to underline is that if there's nothing has got happening in the next 24 hours or 48 hours, that doesn't mean that you are free of uh, a retaliation from Iran in the next days, weeks, or months. They are patient and they know what they want to do, no? And definitely they want to, as uh, the, the, the Supreme Leader said once, they want to put Israel on fire, no? And, uh, and that uh, that's something that we knew, and uh, Israel, thank God, has been preparing for many decades now, and maybe we are reaching a point where it's unavoidable to confront the reality. No? As General Gavish also mentioned, uh, the uh, Iranians have already started their attacks on Israel on October 7th, with facilitating financing and directing many of the activities uh, perpetrated against Israel with a brutal onslaught, uh, which ensued also a low-intensity war by Hezbollah, uh, additional strikes and attacks by Ansar Allah, namely the Houthi-dominated terrorist organization, and uh, Hashd al-Shabi and others throughout this region, uh, something that, of course, Israel will also not turn a blind eye to. And these uh, activities will ensue and, and evolve as time progresses, but it's a very interesting school of thought, Mr. Owen. Well, we seem to be uh, uh, going back in time uh, six months to early October, right after the uh, uh, massacre on the 7th, when President Biden uh, said his famous uh, don't. And uh, he directed it uh, at both uh, Iran, including Hezbollah and Israel. And the reason is that uh, what uh, the uh, U.S. administration and Biden personally don't want to see is uh, either an Iranian attack on Israel or Israeli preemption. Because what would uh, the Israeli leadership do if uh, it has uh, absolute uh, knowledge of uh, Iranian missiles on the launching pads and um, preparations for an attack, and even though these will not be uh, warheads with weapons of mass destruction material, nevertheless, uh, such a massive attack uh, may uh, be uh, too costly for Israel to absorb. So one of the options uh, any uh, responsible government uh, would have to consider would be preemption. But that preemption would, of course, self-fulfill the prophecy. And there would be war between Israel and Iran. So the um, effort on Biden's part is, um, uh, on uh, the one hand, to tell the Iranians to back off and to tell Israel, don't attack. We will protect you. And if um, there is indeed an Iranian attack under certain circumstances, 
not only will we not hold you off in your response, but may even uh, join you. All of that in order for Israel to keep calm for the time being. General Gavish, prospects of nuclear acceleration is something that, of course, Israel has always taken into the account. And uh, the red line set by uh, Israel and the United States, for that matter, uh, to never allow Iran attain a nuclear weapon uh, is something that remains on the table. And therefore, in such an event where we would see an evident reality in which the Iranians would pursue a nuclear arsenal, could we see such a preemptive strike not only against efforts to prepare for a strike currently against Israel proper, but also against uh, the Iranian homeland, as you noted earlier? You know, Jonathan, I, I think that uh, I, I thought it uh, all, all along the time, but uh, now I'm sure that uh, both uh, Rafael and Amir are uh, super in what they are doing because uh, all the options are on the table. And I fully agree with what was uh, said by uh, both of them. Of course, we are not going to discuss operational uh, thoughts here in Israel, but all the options are on the table. And uh, everything is being uh, thought it could be all, all those uh, all those really options that were uh, just mentioned. So we are preparing ourselves uh, for for everything. We must do it. Uh, we, of course, if there is a statement uh, by the Iranian, uh, we have to take it uh, seriously. This is what we do for sure uh, as a military. But you could see also the way that it is, it is being conveyed to the Israeli people. From one side, uh, the IDF spokesman is talking about the threats. He's talking about the options. Uh, but then from the other side, he, as, he is asking everyone to behave, you know, let, let's take it in a proportion. And, and if something would happen, you would hear the siren and we all know uh, what we are going to do. Uh, of course, for the Iranian, just us being in, in a, you know, being terrorized by only by the thought, this is also something that they would like to gain. So, we, you know, we have to look at it on all those uh, different uh, channels. Uh, but going directly to your uh, question, Everything is on the table. Of course, uh, I think IDF uh, uh, Chief of General Staff, Helsi Alevi, uh, he put it quite clearly, don't panic, remain vigilant, uh, which is a, a good Thank equation you. to uh, pursue. With that being said, of course, Dr. Bardahi, uh, the Iranians have also a lot to lose, uh, particularly uh, if they were to pursue such uh, adventurism. Uh, I don't want to list potential targets not to uh, play into their uh, game, but uh, something that was already mentioned here on uh, the program a couple of times is their clear vulnerability in Bandar Abbas, which is their main uh, oil and energy output, as well as other places that could potentially be targeted in the event of such an escalation. Yes, correct. I think they have many hardened places, but there are also ma many, many vulnerable inf critical infrastructure that can be hit um, not easily, but uh, with some degree of confidence that you can inflict a severe damage. But uh, my reflection will go in the other direction. It's, let's imagine for a second, a terrible and dramatic second, that this current crisis may be happening in a year or two years' time when they have declared themselves a nuclear power. How much difference could be made for the planners and authorities in Israel and in the Western world if Iran w w was threatening Israel under the nuclear umbrella of their own? No? That's why I think it's very important not to decouple that prospect from the current situation, from a regime that is threatening the security and the safety of the whole region and the whole, whole world. And uh, that's something we cannot forget. No, There is a major risk of that happening again under totally different circumstances if Iran becomes nuclear at some point, as they wish. Absolutely. I'd like to uh, follow up on that and double down, actually, with a question on two actors. Uh, namely, they were members or are still members uh, of the P5 plus one, Russia and China, have called for restraint. They both understand the uh, significance of uh, such a situation going out of hand with Russia, of course, having vested interests in Syria and China having already uh, invested heavily in critical infrastructure in Iran, 
they, they stand to lose a lot. Do you see this call for restraint actually backed by certain activities? I think the Russians are very hypocritical, uh, calling for restraint when they have unleashed a total war in Ukraine in the last few years. But I think they they may fear that if uh, a, a war breaks out between Israel and some Western allies and Iran, they may lose much more than preventing Iran from retaliation now in kind, no? as, as they think. Uh, but uh, we have to take benefit of all negative situations where we are. No? Maybe the, 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 there are no other better uh, situation where we can really deal finally with the existential threat of Iran. No? Mr. Owen? Well, uh, we have heard uh, of uh, Secretary of State Blinken calling the uh, Chinese uh, foreign minister, the um, uh, Turkish foreign minister, and the Saudi foreign minister. At least up to now, we haven't heard uh, of his calling Sergei Lavrov. Um, obviously, he doesn't want to ask favors uh, from the Russians. And uh, But as Rafael said, the Russians have their own interests. They don't want to see uh, an Iranian drone factory blown up. Um, and they will uh, uh, be, of course, short of the weapons of war they need uh, uh, for Ukraine, in addition to the other repercussions. What, what we have here is, in some regard, an echo of 1991, before the uh, Iraqis uh, launched missiles at Israel and the uh, Bush administration put pressure on Israel uh, to uh, neither uh, try to preempt nor retaliate uh, for various uh, political uh, reasons, uh, not uh, to have the alliance uh, crumble uh, if Israel becomes involved in the war and the Arab participants, Egypt and Syria and uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, backing off. But here, what we have here um, after those uh, uh, decades is uh, Doron Gavish and uh, his colleagues for the first time Israel has uh, such uh, an effective force um, able to defend uh, its uh, airspace and population that uh, it is uh, able to consider um, not only offensive options, but also uh, bracing for an attack and only then uh, deciding what to do. And um, as you said, uh, again, an echo of a, an earlier war, that would be the uh, uh, London Blitz of 1940, keep calm and carry on. Indeed. Well, of course, uh, Secretary Blinken's uh, State Department spokesman, Matthew Miller, did also mention the fact that uh, uh, they had a conversation with uh, Wang Yi, his Chinese uh, counterpart, State Councilor of Beijing, uh, and there was not a lot of information coming out of that uh, conversation. And one uh, stands to wonder uh, to what degree are the Chinese capable of restraining Iran at a time when they failed to do so in the Red Sea, where they stand to uh, make uh, additional losses uh, in uh, Bab el Mandeb, considering the fact that much of uh, the seaborne uh, commodities transiting those strategic waterways happen to be Chinese. Uh, and uh, I'd like to ask you, General Kavish, of course, uh, this has to do a lot with uh, quality versus quantity, something that is being deliberated on a philosophical level in uh, various uh, Western militaries. Uh, Israel's qualitative military edge is far exceeding that of Iran. Nevertheless, the Iranians have managed to accumulate one of the largest arsenals of uh, surface-to-service uh, projectiles, be they drones or missiles of sorts. Uh, to what degree is the calculus of a decisive retaliatory response in the event that such a uh, attempt by the Iranians would bear fruition? Well, yeah. Once again, I would say, uh, Jonathan, all, all the options are, are in the table. I mean, uh, Israel is preparing itself to any scenario and uh, with the basically with the with the with work uh, accordingly i mean we see where things are uh, going and then we we would uh, decide alongside with it of course israel is looking on it uh, on uh, interest we are now talking about uh, iran but we have to remember that we are in a war 
In the Gaza Strip, uh, Amir talked about it uh, in a few words uh, before, we have the Lebanese uh, border that uh, we still need to solve some, some things uh, over there. So everything has to you know, be taken in, uh, into the consideration. Uh, we still didn't gain the both uh, um, aims of uh, to the, the, the both goals of uh, this war. So we have a way to go there. Uh, so in general, we say we know that it is not uh, Israel interest to start a, a, a very large uh, war. But then from the other end, if uh, something like this uh, or if an attack uh, toward Israel uh, would be at the end of the day uh, being done by uh, the Iranian, and of course that Israel would have to uh, retaliate and, and very uh, strongly. Uh, so all the options are there. The, at the end of the day, if we're looking on the interest of Israel. By the way, I don't, I'm not sure that this is for the interest of the Iranian to, to start now a war. If, you know, if, if I could uh, analyze it, I think that they have a lot to lose. Uh, other maybe their uh, pride, but from, from the other, all the other options, I think uh, they are not for the good for them, but they could do their own calculations. Uh, we are going back to our interest, and uh, we, we have to remember that uh, at the end of the day, we prefer to to uh, to deal with the war that uh, we have now and now and not to open a full scale war, but if this is what would be needed, uh, we are prepared to do it. They would lose, of course, to one thing that they hold dear, and that is the seat of power in Tehran. Uh, but uh, we're drawing near to the end of the program. One sentence, Dr. Barrahi, the floor is yours. I think uh, General Gabi said Israel is ready to take any potential action, and uh, it should keep all the cards uh, on the table and all options on the table. That's the best way to project deterrence, and that's the best way to convince the allies that Israel is prepared to deal with any contingency. And if we, the world and the international community, wants to avoid a war in the region, we should help Israel to make a stronger deterrence against all their enemies, including Iran in this time. Well, that's all the time that we have for today. I'd like to thank Dr. Bardahi, General Gavish, and Mr. Oren for your time and insight, of course. I'd like to thank all of you at home as well. Until our next update, from here in Jerusalem, Shalom. My name is uh, Doron Gavish and my background, uh, 30 years of uh, serving in the Israeli Air Force. My last job I was the commander of the Israeli Air and Missile Defense uh, during the uh, introduction of the Iron Dome to the Defense of Israel. All of this allows me really to be part of the team here in uh, TV7. It is uh, super important to have uh, such a platform. Uh, we talk about the global situation, we talk about Israel and uh, those uh, different angles uh, which are relevant to the discussion.